A question I sometimes get is, how do I get my hands on all of the games I play for the channel? As well as just to play casually by myself or with friends watching. Because I have this backlog app that I sometimes show screenshots of, and the sheer number of games I own tends to raise some eyebrows, so I can totally understand this question. The truth is, I do not spend an unhealthy amount on games like that number might make you assume. In fact, I only spend about 10 to 30 dollars on games a month, I want to say. Half the price of most AAA games these days, or less than half. Has it gone up again? Gotta hate AAA gaming. The answer is quite simple, really. Bundles. Once a week, I make a note to check a few particular sites for game deals. Stuff like Humble or Itch.io. They offer these deals sometimes where you can get anywhere from half a dozen to literally hundreds of games for, most of the time, less than $15. You're never gonna play them all, and heck, a lot of the time some of the games you'll find yourself sad with aren't even that great, but if there's ever a couple things in a bundle I particularly want to try, I'll probably give it a purchase. Even better, the proceeds of a lot of these bundles go to charity too, so you're even helping a good cause on top of that. Oh yeah, I also checked the weekly free game on Epic too, for good measure. I've gotten some great stuff through that. People will often say that gaming is an expensive hobby, but I couldn't disagree more, you just need to know where to look. The topic of today's video is a game I got through one of the said bundles, the IGN FanFest Bundle of Humble. It is long over by this point, but I got this selection of games from it. The one I was most excited to play was Wobble Dogs. Wobble Dogs is an absolute treasure of a game, created by Tom Astle in 2022. It advertised itself as a casual sandbox pet simulator where you raise a hive of rapidly mutating dogs. It was reviewed exceptionally well. I played it with some friends watching, not sure what to really expect truthfully, outside of a pretty silly time. It was a pretty silly time, but hiding beneath it all was a game with a lot of depth that I wasn't really expecting either. There's something very charming to me about a game that looks a little bit like a joke at first glance, whether it be because of the visuals, the premise, or the story, but as soon as you start digging into it a bit, you realize that it's like the coolest thing you've ever seen in your life. Case in point, you start your game with just these simple pink dogs with a blue head and legs, but as you mess around with the mechanics more and more, you'll slowly start to notice as they grow and especially as you breed them, different properties. Maybe their eye will look a tiny bit different, maybe their body will be a slightly different color. If you're really lucky, you might breed one with a tail or something. The more you play, the more no two wobble dogs will ever look the same, as you grow further and further away from that base. You find yourself wondering what actually influences their appearance. Is it random? Well, to a degree, kinda. But what really affects what they look like is their diet. You get a bunch of these dispensers that produce as much of these various food items as you want. Food items that on the surface seem a little silly and random. Burritos, french fries, chicken nuggets. But as your dogs eat, you'll notice these strange particle effects come off of them. Are these random too? Well, not really. As you click on this little magnifying glass, you'll... Oh god, what is this? As your dog eats, they'll adopt gut flora. And you can see all this microbacteria here. The flora in a dog's gut will affect how it looks as it grows up and even how its offspring will look. Every food item can give you typically one to three types of flora. And as you see any given floor's effects in action, it'll automatically fill out in this massive helpful guide that tells you what every flora does, the properties it gives your dogs, and what food you can find it in. It even gave you a little flavor text for each one, like how Contra Riolis is sort of hard to pronounce, but that's not really its fault. Ever seen a bacteria be described as cute before? Apparently that one comes from the donut. I love how some of these make complete sense too, like how the pancake gives you a flora that makes your dog a little flatter, <laughs> or how a candy cane gives them a mix of red and white patterns. God, look how deep this goes, Christ! And when a game is this open about its mechanics like this, you know what that means? That's right, you can min-max it. There is some randomness you won't have control over for sure, but you're given way more agency than you would have really expected from a game like this. Want your dog and its offspring to be immensely large? Feed a bunch of pizza bagels, lasagna, and onion rings. 
Want them to have a tiny head? Fish pellets and raisins. Want your dog to have wings? That's what onion rings and cactus fruit are for. And let me tell you, if you know what you're doing, you can make some real freaks of nature in this game. Some real biblically accurate wobble dogs, if you will. If you were to do a cursory image search of this game, you'll often find tons of screenshots of dogs with abnormally strange properties. These often come from players who fully understand the flora mechanic and how to use it to essentially play god. Another thing I love about this mechanic is it's surprisingly casual friendly too. If you're not the type to take complete advantage of mechanics like this, you'll likely just be feeding your dogs random foods, or foods you think are funny. You know, whatever happens to be around or looks interesting. And at that point, what your dogs turn into is, for all intents and purposes, pretty darn random, which is enjoyable in its own right too. It's fun no matter how you approach the flora system. Whether you're making a complete mockery of it or pretending it hardly exists at all, it'll lead to an entirely unique playthrough where no two dogs will be the same. It's pretty brilliant. Little side about the dog, but I love how the game opens on this disclaimer that the Wobble Dogs are not normal, and just because they can eat something in the game doesn't mean you should feed it to an actual dog, like moon pies or garlic bread. Not to mention more obvious ones too, like, um insulation, or the dead parts of other dogs. Yeah, Wobble Dogs are cannibals, don't question it. You know, there's kind of this strange running theme in the game of every aspect reminding you that Wobble Dogs are not actual dogs. You got the food thing, but then some weird item descriptions here and there, like this dog doll, which looks more like a real dog than our wobbly friends, but is described as having, and I quote, the likeness of an unknown creature. Huh. There's a lot of evidence actually to suggest that the Wobble Dogs are more insect-like than mammals, actually. You got the cannibalism, you got the store page and tutorial describing your collection of dogs as a hive. The play area itself even looks like a bug terrarium. An early trailer describes the game as dog-inspired. Some of the mutations include things like bug wings and bug eyes. They have a much shorter lifespan like insects. They hatch from eggs and even turn into cocoons when they mature. I can't say there's much of a story or even hidden lore to this game uh, that we know of, but I do have a personal headcanon that this game takes place in a future or separate timeline where real dogs are either extinct or rare enough that descriptions like this make sense and you're a scientist trying to learn more about these insect-like dogs, possibly to unveil them to the world at some point as some kind of man-made alternative to man's best friend. There's also a lot of themes of simulation and gene manipulation peppered here and there that adds to this theory of mine. Heck, the game even gives you a lot of tasks to complete in the form of goals. Not achievements, goals. I mean, for all intents and purposes, they are just achievements, but you get rewards for doing them that often facilitate the further creation of stranger dogs. Maybe it's evocative of the scientists making new breakthroughs and uncovering more ways to experiment as a result. Speaking of, if I had to give any advice to anyone starting out with this game, it actually would be to go after achievements as much as you can. The game calls them goals for a reason. They're not cute little side things you get silly rewards for. They're a part of progression, and the game gates off very useful tools, items, features, and even new dogs behind them. If there were any I would recommend going after first, well, for the first hour of your playtime, you're gonna get a bunch of preliminary ones just by playing the game. But an easy one you can get right away that some players might not think to get is, um, mail time. Any dog you can possibly create, you can actually create sort of a seed for. A long string of letters and numbers unique to it. And you can actually share the seed online, and then another player can take it and import a copy of your dog into their world. This is a feature I did not expect, and it's super cool. Heck, it even gives casual players a way to play around with those absurd dogs you'll find online, as many creators will share their codes alongside any images they post. And for importing your first dog, you get the achievement Mail Time, with the reward of a storage chest. It gives you an itemized list of every object in your world, and allows you to clean up and collect items from a single menu. For how busy the game with items can get sometimes, this is incredibly useful for cleaning up clutter that might have gotten out of hand. Store items you'd like to use later but don't want your dogs eating or something, or pick up important items you may have missed because it was hidden behind decoration or dogs or just under piles of food and stuff. 
Two other great achievements to get early are positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. You can kinda train your dogs in this game, though it's a feature I never played around with too much, just never really saw the point of how short of a lifespan dogs have in this game, but if you see a dog doing an action, you can praise or scold them for it, and it'll change their behavior from that point forward. And as a cool nod to realism, behavior changes are more likely to stick the younger a dog is. That's kind of neat. An easy way to get these two achievements is to repeatedly alternate between asking your dog to sit, and then either praising or scolding them, whichever achievement you're going for. And your rewards are two brand new dogs with some neat properties that are super fun to pass down to offspring. It definitely gives you a nice head start on discovering new mutations if you're getting a little tired of the default dog look. Another thing I love about the game's achievements is that they're not unreasonable. It's always a pet peeve of mine when a game inconsiderately asks the world of you if you're going for completion, either that be of your skill level or even worse, your time. I just don't like games that don't respect your time. You ever wondered why no one ever 100%s pet sims, life sims, or live service games? Those genres are kinda synonymous with that for me. They're great fun, but after I get a ways in, the looming thought that I'll probably never fully and complete them just turns me off a bit. But Wobble Dogs' achievements are pretty reasonable, making for probably the first, like, pet sim I've ever 100%ed. There's only a few achievements I'd describe as unreasonable, but even those ones aren't like that that bad. It's mostly stuff like asking you to hatch a dog with a specific leg missing, like that was a hell of a waiting game, or completing the Flora Field Guide. I just wish there was a little more thought put into a couple of these, like maybe one of the unlockable dogs would have the wrong leg missing in an attempt to train you how leg manipulation works, or god make some of the food items easier to get if you're going to require the player to collect each and every one of them. My big issue is that while you get most of the food items through these dispensers that unlock more food that you can feed your dogs through achievements, like that's pretty fun, there's also a certain selection of random foods that require certain furniture items or floors, for as random as that sounds. Specifically, the sample table for the sample cup, the prickly pear plant for the cactus fruit, and then the dirt clump snow fish pellet and insulation tuft which are all acquired by having your dog dig them up on certain floors. That last food item, by the way, isn't even listed on the wiki, and it was a pain in the ass to find the information on it. How I would remedy this is to just make some of the achievements give you these two items and one of each floor. Also, making the leg number mutation a rare occurrence from the Cresselia flora is just cruel for completion. I like the idea of super rare mutations, although making the empty cocoon and dud egg the only two food items in the game to have the modifier this rare feels almost like a troll. Those two items are uncommon enough that I don't think making leg number an uncommon mutation instead would have ruined anything. I also don't like how some of these achievements require you to hurt or overly annoy your dogs. You never, like, kill them or emotionally scar them or anything, but repeatedly having to scold them for something that isn't their fault or making them eat poop just kind of made me feel bad. I don't like dens as a mechanic either. I actually had to look up how these work and how to make one because the game doesn't really explain them very well. There's like a four-step process to it, and at least two of those involve just waiting around for your dogs to randomly do something to it. And even once they're built, all they serve to do is obscure items in your dogs inside of them, which is not very fun to me. It detracts from the potential chaos you can witness, which is a big part of the experience to me. Sorry to rant there for a second, though my point still stands. It's just a casual fun time to collect everything in this game, and you can tell how fun it is by the fact that even after I did, I still occasionally played the game from time to time. Let me tell you, this is a perfect type of game to play around Discord groups too. I love just dropping into random VCs and playing this for a bit and seeing everyone's silly reactions to things. Fun fact, but nearly every dog in this review's footage is named after someone I played the game around. Like, it's just a perfect little silly thing. <laughs> Something about the head developer too, but did you know that he was also involved in the programming for Tattletale? He also did work on a game called Animal Inspector, uh, another one called Zenith, and even The Sims 4. Also, I found a website for a wildlife photographer of the same name, and I... 
genuinely don't know if it's the same person or not. They got different Twitter handles, so I'm leaning towards no, though photographer Tom does suspiciously have a lot of insect photos in their portfolio. Maybe there's a connection here? Nah, it's probably just a coincidence. The game's visual style is so charming, it uses a lot of bright, blocky colors and shapes for an overall aesthetic that really catches your attention. It's unlike anything I've ever seen before. By the way, you can also customize all of these rooms in your hive. Dogs can lay prize capsules that contain random wallpapers and furniture items, and it's fun to mess around with what's available to make a play area entirely your own. It's hard to get bored here, truly. The room customization mode is pretty intuitive too. You see this feature a lot in sandbox games like this, and I always have this issue where the actual UI and controls are pretty clunky and more annoying than it's worth. Never had that feeling here though. The only issue I do have with this decorating mode is actually nothing to do with the mode itself. I just think you get furniture items way too slowly. There's tons of them in the game, but you can only get them one at a time whenever your dogs lay one of those capsules. I swear you only get one like every half hour or so, and that's if you notice the capsule among your pile of knots and strewn about the floor, and if you tally up just how many there are, it quickly had me going, seriously? Thankfully, and I actually think this is an awesome feature, but you can just cheat them in. The game gives you access to a devlog that you can use to spawn items and modify your dogs. With a command, you can also spawn enough capsules to acquire every item in one fell swoop, and Okay, this is just satisfying. I've actually seen people make ball pits in the game by doing this before. Is this cheating? Yeah, although it's the fun kind of cheating to me. Heck, with all the simulation and science motif of the game, this actually fits thematically that you can just hack stuff in and like cheat the game like this. <laughs> in a weird sort of way, it even kind of adds to the immersion to me. The game doesn't even punish you for using these codes to help you get achievements, which... Your mileage may vary on if that's a good thing or not. Personally, I like it. I never use the devlog to outright give me achievements, which you can do, I just didn't. But I mostly use some codes as an aid to a degree where I still had to do some stuff on my own. For example, one of the food items you need for completion is the dud egg, which you get by just feeding your dogs garbage and then they'll occasionally lay them. I didn't want to do that, so I cheated the dud eggs in. I mean, heck, I don't see this as any more cheating than using the import dog function, and you can cheat some achievements just as easily of that. I don't know, man. Let people play games how they want to play them. I still felt accomplished at the end of the day, and that's all that matters to me. The dogs themselves are adorable. Dogs are already inherently easy to love, but how this game takes their basic shapes and simplifies it even more to make a design that's cute, memorable, and perfectly modular for all those weird changes you can breed onto them? It's kind of impressive that I've never seen characters like this before. Something about their expressions are endlessly entertaining too. They have like this... like pool toy face to them almost? I don't know if that's the best term for it, but that's the best I can come up with and that comes to mind. <laughs> you know, those drawn on facial features that are flush with the head and swap between different illustrations when they need to emote. It's a really cute look to me. It's especially comedic too, as they derp around, flop between rooms, get thrown all over the place, get stuck on occasion. For some reason, the tubes that connect the rooms, like, suck in your wobble dogs and launch them out the other end, and it never fails to make me laugh. It's good slapstick, truthfully, and given the sandbox nature of the game, you're never quite sure what's going to happen, which definitely adds to the entertainment too. Some friends have told me that the dogs look like characters I design, even. Honestly, I can kind of see it. I love simple shapes in my characters, unnatural colors, and wide expressions. Genuinely, I'm kind of shocked there was never a plush of these things. Can you imagine a storefront where you could, like, custom order your own wobble dog with its own colors, printed on features, patterns, maybe even some wings or extra legs for extra money, I guess? That'd probably be a lot of work, but it would be cute. I don't really know where else to put this, but something funny I found is, uh... Did you guys know I still play VR chat? Oh my god, remember that video I made a couple years back about this game? I don't know why, but ever since I made that video, I had a habit of finding a brand new avatar related to most of the video essays I worked on as I'm working on them. I found an Ivor avatar when working on Minecraft story mode, I found Box Fox while working on Battle and Wonderworld, and now I've found a Wobble Dog skin. So this is like, what, eight skins I frequently use in the game now? including these two extras. God, my playstyle on that game has changed immensely ever since I came out as a furry. 
You know what else I find charming? Wobble Dogs' music. I get like Wii in 3DS era sim game vibes from it, if that makes sense. Think something like Tamodachi Life, I guess. It's chirpy and quirky, but slow and relaxed enough that it's never draining or annoying to listen to. It's a game that's very easy to lose time with, and the soundtrack definitely helps with that. The best song in the game is Dingo Bingo, in my opinion. I'm always in a good mood when that comes on. I like how the game has some minor difficulty considerations too. For starters, you can actually change the average lifespan of your dogs, or even make them entirely immortal. I never played around with this as the come and go nature feels very natural to me. And also, if a dog is about to die of old age that you'd like to hold on to for their genetics, you can actually just stuff them in your storage space and they'll never die in there. <laughs> But if that's not enough, and you want just a little more time to play with your dogs normally because the thought of them dying or getting cannibalized or that just might stress you out at all, it's an option you can turn on. There's also this pretty interesting feature where the game will, like, literally play itself, essentially turning it into a glorified screensaver. Again, never really messed around with this, but the, the ability to play the game like this is a neat novelty. God, I just think Wobble Dog is a great game that everyone should at least try once, you know? It's so cute, and you're bound to have some good laughs with it, even if it's not exactly your thing. The only criticism I really have is that $20 is a little pricey in my opinion. If you can't tell from the start of this video, I never spend too much on games, so maybe my standards are skewed here. But $20, from my perspective, is a pretty premium price for an indie game, and... At the end of the day, this is something that might not be for everyone, so it's kind of a big ask for entry. It does go on sale fairly frequently, though, so if this does look up your alley, give it a wish list and wait a bit. Heck, wish list it anyway, you never know. And that's my little insight on Wobble Dogs. Seriously, this game is really something special, and I hope a review like this will get some more eyes on it. Regardless, thank you to my Patreon supporters, Royal Plot, Trevor, Sean, Firestrike, and Great Wolf. Your continued support is always appreciated. If you enjoyed the video, share it around, as that, that always helps the channel. Let me know what you think of this shorter video format, too. I might stick with it for a couple videos, because doing some smaller projects has been a little refreshing. And I will see you folks later. Thanks for watching.